how to be a champion for Christ. Champion for Christ. Isn't that a great term? A champion for Christ. Of course, we become a champion by being a servant. We understand that. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you have to learn to be the servant of all. But still, that title, Champion for Christ. And this morning, we're going to take a look at how one might become a champion for Christ from Hebrews chapter number 12. This is the moment when we should pray once again, asking God to fill our hearts with his word. Lord, we come to you this morning with our hearts wide open. Why not? Lord, we trust you with all of our heart. We don't want to lean under our own understandings. We want to acknowledge you and let you direct our lives. And you direct us best when God the Holy Spirit speaks to us through your word. Now, Lord, we believe that all scripture is inspired by God. We believe that it's profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction so that the man or woman of God might be thoroughly equipped unto every good work And so we lay our hearts bare before you, Lord, and say, speak, your servants, your church is listening. We just want to glorify you. We want to be strong servants of the Lord, which will translate it into being a champion for Christ. And so, God, we commit this all to you now. By faith in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. So just as a runner keeps his eyes focused on the finish line, you know what I mean, a a sprinter, as he's running down that 100-meter race, he's not looking around at the stands or looking at his competitors. He's looking towards that finish line, and he lets his eyes just draw him across that line. In the same way, Paul's eyes were fixed on the ultimate prize of standing before the Lord and hearing the words, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter in to the joy of the Lord. Even more, just as a boxer, a fighter, prize fighter, he carefully targets his his punches at his opponents. Paul promises to make his punches count against sin and darkness and evil. It's really very interesting if you read the letters of Paul that in many of them, he uses Olympic sport as an image for the Christian life. For example, before we even get to Hebrews 12, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he begins by speaking like a man who's about to run a race, a speedster, a, a, a runner in the Olympics. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 9, Do you not know that those who run a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run, therefore, in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, has self-control in all things, and they do it to obtain a perishable crown, some sort of a wreath or some money, but we for an imperishable crown. And then, sort of boasting like a prize fighter, you know, a Christian Muhammad Ali, He continues, thus I fight not as one who beats against the air, I'm not shadow boxing, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, God forbid, I myself should become disqualified. So we see in many places in the scripture where Paul associates sports, Olympic sports, to Christianity. And why did he do that? Because he lived in a world like we live in that seems to be fascinated with athletics. There's a couple of big football games today, isn't there? There'll be millions and millions of people watching those games. And Olympic games in the days of Paul were the talk of all the nations. Athletes came from basically three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And they converged to compete in what was then called the Olympic Games. They were ancient Olympic Games. So his choice of using sports as a metaphor for our walk with the Lord, it really is a good one. It's a good illustration. Now these athletes, which this is interesting, would train for nine months in order to compete. 
Not less, not more, but nine months. That was the rule. And it was a very strict, disciplined, and rigorous training. They gave up nearly all physical pleasures in preparing for the competition, all in the hopes of winning a coveted prize. And that's why they trained so hard, because they savored the idea of knowing that at some point they'd be ranked as, as champions. Oftentimes their names were engraved on memorial stones in cities and, and towns. They were highly esteemed. Uh, they were celebrities. People would gawk at them in the marketplace and gather around. They had songs written about them. They became national heroes. Audiences of people would pay to watch them train. So the ancient athlete lived for the day that a judge would crown him champion of some particular sport. But again, this honor came at a high price. So I want to emphasize that. It was hard work to become a champion. And they were willing to deny the flesh today for the promise of victory tomorrow. I know you relate to that. Isn't that a good sentence? They were willing to deny the flesh today for the promise of victory tomorrow. The judges were interesting. The men that were chosen to be judges were nobility, noble citizens, people with high integrity. They sat on thrones, and they dressed in purple and gold. They would start the contest, and they would judge the winners. They made certain that the athletes competed according to the rules. And so there's a nice little metaphor there, and Paul uses all of that in his writings to inspire Christians. Now, as we read Hebrews chapter 12, Paul gives us a picture again of runners, and they're about to run a race, and they're casting aside their training weights. They're striving to win. They're pressing to the finish line, running hard with an eye on the prize. And so the connection to that metaphor on our faith it's already understandable to all of us, but I think as we read on, it's going to be even easier to see and something we can make application of in our lives. Now, here's the reason he was writing to these people, because the believers in Jerusalem at this point in time, in the early church, were being challenged not to quit. Like an athlete, they were to keep pressing on, well, towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so this letter seems to be directed towards a community of believers that had, that had well, grown weary. Grown weary of walking with the Lord. They were worn down. And they were beginning, at least some of them, or there was a little movement within the early church there, uh, to give up. Growing weary and giving up. Maybe those words strike your heart. Maybe some of you are growing weary. And are tempted to give up. And say, well, I've accepted the Lord. I'm a Christian. That's all that's needed. I'll just live out the rest of my life and die and go to heaven. That's probably true. But we're never called to give up. We're called to press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're all still serving and growing and developing as Christians. These people had stopped running forward. And that's not right. Most of you have heard of Greg Laurie. Let me read a quote from him. Becoming a Christian takes only a single step. You all remember that night when you took that single step or that day or that moment in time. But then he goes on in his next sentence, being a Christian, though, means running with Christ for the rest of your life. 
even when you're 75, for the rest of your life. So apparently the Jerusalem Christians were tempted to give up fighting the good fight. And if you really look at lots of commentaries by experts who have studied this book in this period of time, many had already turned back, and they had turned back to the traditions of Judaism, and as far as Paul was concerned, wow, that would never do. No, no. Because his point, and our Lord's point, and the Bible's point, is that Christianity is always a forward-looking faith. It's always looking forward. You're always moving forward towards something, and we know what that something is, is to be in the presence of the Lord. Either after we die, when our spirit goes to be with the Lord, or or through the rapture of the church, or whatever might be the vehicle that would get us there, we're all looking forward to paradise with God. So the Christian faith is one that's always looking forward. It's not supposed to be stagnant. We're always supposed to have a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. All of us in our lives should have a short-term vision, you know, for the next month or something. Then we should have a mid-term vision, a long-term vision. A church should have all of those as well, mid, short, long. And then, of course, an eternal vision as well. Now, to have that vision is very important because it's not easy to be a Christian. You have to have a goal. The Christian life isn't a playground, as you know. Not by any stretch of the imagination. It is a battlefield. And the longer I'm walking with the Lord, I know how great that battle is. It doesn't get any easier just because I'm older now. It's a little easier because my daughters are grown and they're not home anymore. (laughs) I had enough of that. They're all, you know, they're very mature now. They're 50 or near 50. So I don't worry about them too much. My dear wife does still, but... I kind of go, oh, they'll be fine. You know, they're 50 years old. (laughs) And so the author here, just like a good coach that's training an athlete, athlete, he challenges his readers to get back into the race. No, no, you can't give up. You have to have a vision, and the vision is the finish line. So this was a time that he was telling them, hey, take a big gulp of living water, take a deep breath, of God the Holy Spirit, and start running again. Start getting going again for the Lord. And that statement I know many of us can relate to. Check out verse number one. He writes, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, pause, a great cloud of witnesses. Who are they? This great cloud of witnesses. Well, I think most of us here that have studied the Bible at all know that this is a reference to the faithful saints listed in chapter number 11. There are a lot more than just spectators sitting in the stands of heaven watching us, more than observers gazing down upon our lives. They are a constant witness to us through the track record of their own amazing faithfulness to God in good times, but especially in tough times. True champions of faith. They show us believers the rewards and the blessings of staying in the race. And their lives, if we read their stories in the Old Testament, they display stamina and commitment and faith and endurance and a word that's probably not in the dictionary, stick to They stuck to it. They would not give up. Notice how verse number one begins. It begins with the word therefore. Therefore, therefore, what does that mean? Therefore, after reading about all these great saints in chapter number 11, we should live and serve and worship and persevere in a fashion similar to what they did. This is all about being real. This is all about Christianity being a tangible faith that we can touch and feel and experience and see. It's not mysterious and cloudy and hazy. You can see it. 
He can see Christianity when it's really working and functioning and being all that it's supposed to be. I see it in all of you that I've spoken to since I've been here. You love the Lord. You love people. You love one another. You want to serve. You want to give. You see, you understand what some Christians, unfortunately, don't understand. The Bible was written to be lived and not just learned. To be lived, not just learned. Lived so that we can prove ourselves faithful as doers of the word and not just hearers of the word only. Now we're doers of the word. Our faith is seen at the supermarket, uh, uh, on our street, in our family, obviously at the church, at the bank, at the school, at our grandson's graduation, whatever it might be, or granddaughter's graduation. So let me say this to you, understanding the people in chapter number 11 and their stories that are told in the Old Testament, the next time you feel like one of them when they were being misunderstood (laughs) or they were being abused or they faced resistance from people around them or the government over them or they struggled with all kinds of challenges. Remember these people. For example, Joseph. Joseph, he's listed in chapter number 11. He was sold, kidnapped, really, kidnapped. Can you imagine that? He was Jacob's favorite son. The other guys, the brothers, got jealous. So they kidnapped him, and not only did they kidnap him, they abused him, and then they they sold him into slavery. Human trafficking is what they were involved in. If anyone could have nursed his wounds, for having that happen to him and said, I give up on God, I give up on all this, this, the Lord God of Israel business, surely Joseph could have. He could have said, if there was a God, this never would have happened to me. But he forgave his brothers instead. He kept his eyes on the Lord. He received vision and prophecy from God. And later, as he rose to power, as God elevated him and rewarded him, He didn't hate his brothers. He loved his brothers, and he took care of them. He made sure they had food and money and and blessed them. He served the God of Israel very well. He was a champion for God for sure. He had very real, tangible faith. When you read his story, you go, wow, I can see his faith in action. Some of us, have trials in our lives. We might even call them a fiery trial. You know, some challenging things. Those of you that are, you know, my age or approximately the same age, you worry about your children. You worry about your grandchildren. Maybe one of your grandchildren is not doing well. Or maybe you're struck with a a health issue that suddenly comes out of nowhere and the doctor says, you know what, you have or there's a financial reversal, or just some, something, a fiery trial. Read the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew something about a fiery trial for real, didn't they? And God delivered them. Actually, if you read into the story just a little bit, it was Jesus that delivered them. It was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. I've asked several of you, how long have you lived in Casa Grande? All the answers have been nine years, or one fellow said 13 years, somebody else said 18 years, but maybe some of you have only been living in Casa Grande for a short season. You came from the Republic of California. (laughs) Or you came from the winters of Minnesota, or who knows, or the winds of Nebraska in January, I don't know. But And moving to a new city, and coming to a new church, you're confronted with the challenge of change. And as we get a little bit older in our lives, we don't like change. We kind of know where everything is. I know where the scissors are. You know what I mean? I don't have to, I know what drawer they're in. You know? I know where I keep my toothbrush. I don't have to look for it every morning. You know? The challenge of change. Well, check out the faith of Abraham. God spoke to his heart, and he said, bye bye, Ur of the Chaldees, and took off for an pretty much an undisclosed destination, sort of, you know, 
said, spoken of generally as the promised land, whatever that meant. The challenge had changed, but he picked up his tent, his people, and his camels, and sheep, and cattle, and off he went. Sometimes out of the blue, a big problem comes. I mean, it's a big one. A big one. It's a giant problem. Well, read about David. In chapter 11, and of course in the Old Testament, the giant slayer, take heart, just a boy with a sling and a rock with great faith. He yelled at Goliath, who are you to come against the Lord God of Israel, the living and true God? Threw a rock and killed him. Clearly dynamic faith, visible faith, tangible faith. All of his brothers and King Saul and everybody else who thought they were great soldiers stood there with their eyes wide open and were amazed at his faith. But that's what he had, a very tangible, noticeable faith. And he was proud of it. Be proud of your faith. Be proud of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Be a torchbearer. Be a champion. And that is the writer's point in the one word, therefore. Whenever you see that word, therefore, stop and take a deep breath. And remember that the Christian life is not intended to be a playground in a park. There's spiritual warf warfare, and it is a battlefield. And when the race gets difficult, and it will, and you feel like quitting, and you might, I have felt like quitting. I could give you some examples of that, but it would take too long. About 10 years ago, I almost quit. It was a very difficult time for me. And I almost went, you know what? I'm kind of done. But then the Lord began to minister to me. It can happen to any of us. Consider those who have run the race before you. And if they ran well, you can too, because, I'll tell you why you can too, you have greater promises than David had. You have greater promises than Abraham had. You have greater promises than Moses had. You have this promise. We can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And all is only three letters, but it's an enormous word. We can do all things. We can be strong in the Lord, the Bible says, and in the power of His might, which is important to remember, church. We have to invoke the Holy Spirit. When we say our prayers, we have to say, Father, please let Your Spirit fall upon me and strengthen me to be the man or the woman of God that you want to be, me to be in this moment so I can be a champion for you and bring glory and honor to the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus made it very clear until the Holy Spirit comes upon us, until that baptism of the Holy Spirit happens, we can't really have the power to be the witnesses we want to be. And I understand the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit can be a one-time moment. I understand. But if you read Paul carefully, he also invokes that concept of asking God the Holy Spirit to re-empower us as needed. And I believe that that is so important. And then even more, adding to this, if you will allow me to do that, drop anything that slows you down. Easier said than done. But look at the Scripture. Continuing in verse number one, after his opening comment, he says, let us lay aside every, look at that word, every. He didn't say one or two things or the one that's bugging you the most. He said, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So when the race becomes difficult, and it always does, look around and see what you're carrying. We tend to look at circumstances, and we look at other people. I'm not happy today because it's Becky's fault. It's always Becky's fault. It's never me. When she's upset and having a bad day, guess whose fault it is? It's Al's fault. You know, we're retired, semi. We're together constantly, so it's either her fault or my fault. There is nobody else to blame. I guess we could blame Nancy Pelosi once in a while, but yeah, we will. It's pretty much just, you know. 
I'm sorry if I offended anybody, but it doesn't sound like I did. So. <laughs> it's their fault I'm slowing down. It's their fault I'm not doing well. And there are moments and times, and I shared with you one for me about a decade ago, where you can even blame God. And I did blame God at that point in time. But that can't be right. How can I blame God? So I have to lay that thought aside. When I get my wits about me again, you know, my spiritual feet underneath me, I have to lay that aside. We are all responsible, are you ready for this, for our own race. Becky's not responsible for my race. She can buoy it by praying for me, and I'm not responsible for her race. That's our own race. That's why he writes, let us, or let me rather, let us lay aside every weight and sin. Disappointments, challenges, troubling things are just a part of life. We're not always going to have it our own way. What I think we need to do is to separate that which is significant from the stuff that's just annoying. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of annoying things in our lives. Eh, that's annoying. That's irritating me. But it's not necessarily significant. And we're all going to have disappointments. We're all going to have challenges. We're all going to have issues. That's just the way life is. That's how God works in our lives. When we get to heaven, we'll be free of disappointments. But, and then I like to always think, well, this thing that's going on in my life, is it going to matter 100 years from now? The answer is absolutely not. And then God will shrink that, and you'll say, is it going to matter 100 days from now? I'm going to go, no, I'm going to remember it in 100 days. How about 100 minutes? How about one minute? How about a one-minute conversation with the person you love to straighten out the problem? Boom. God's grace is there, isn't it? When I'm acting as a natural man or natural men or women, when they have a problem, it always triggers a series and they sort of escalate of troubling reactions. Hurt, then anger, then frustration, and then, God forbid, if it lands in your heart, the bitterness. Because bitterness just wrecks you. So unless we learn to deal with disappointments in the power of the Lord, they'll rob us of love and joy and peace, all the things that the fruit of the Spirit or the Spirit wants to produce in our lives. Champions for Christ, you see, they're overcomers. They get past stuff. They don't live in it. They don't embrace it and lock it in their heart and say, I am bitter towards my sister and that is it. No, that's not being an overcomer. That's not being an overcomer. And we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And if we falter and we fail and we don't do well when things get a little tough, what hope is there for the rest of the world? Last week I told you about my new neighbor next door, Jeff. What a nice guy. If he sees me, he's not a believer yet, and if he sees me caving in, bummed out, all angry or bitter, or, you know, raising my fist against the world and all of that, what hope is there for him? Because disappointments and problems and issues are not a sign that God has forsaken us or stopped loving us. That's what the devil wants you to believe. Oh, he doesn't love you anymore. You've got cancer. He's done with you. He just let it happen. He doesn't love you. No, God's love for us never fails. And when we're in the middle of a trial or a challenge, that's when his love just can just pour out on us with strength and grace. So we don't want to carry things. The secret of success when running the race is to strip down to the essentials. You can't run a race carrying two sacks of cement or, you know, four two-by-fours on this shoulder and another four two-by-fours on that shoulder. It just won't work. You can't run the Christian race covered in a thick layer of bitterness or anger or fear or even doubt. So the writer here, Paul, is referring to anything that keeps you from running your way, race well. It needs to be identified and laid at the foot of the cross. Anything that hinders your walk. The Greek and Roman runners, as 
I referred to them at the beginning of the message, they used to put somehow tie weights on their ankles and they'd practice with those weights and then the day of the race or just before you know, the race day or whatever, they'd take the weights off and then they felt free and young and vibrant and they could run faster than ever. I guess it would be wrong if I didn't tell you that even good things can encumber us. I don't know what those might be. There are things, you know that. But Evil things, sinful things will always entangle us. And so unless we get rid of those kinds of sins that I've been talking about in our lives, those kinds of sins will trip us up. It'll rob you of the good things that God has for you. I'm speaking from the voice of experience. So run your race well. And if you see there's a weight, drop it. And remember, it's our faith that's being tested, not the other guys. The sin of Israel tripped up Israel. Unbelief robbed that entire generation from crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land, and they blamed everybody else. But you know what? They had no one to blame but themselves. They didn't embrace and have faith in the plan of God. Israel didn't have faith for the wonderful things that God had in store for them. Here's the scripture. I think I quoted it last week as well. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But getting prepared to get there, to receive all those things, stuff happens. Lack of faith in what God has for us just slows us down, and we start falling backwards. And there's nothing in the scripture about Christians going backwards. Whenever you read about any man or woman of faith in the Bible that went backwards, they ended up in a whole peck of trouble. So you've got to get rid of stuff. Becky and I moved about 15 years ago from a house in Prescott to a new home in Prescott Valley. It was a big change for us. We were... Uh, pretty settled in the old house. Immediately we, I say we generously, Becky, because it was more me than you, but immediately we discovered how much stuff we had around the house. You remember? A lot of stuff. Most of it was, was, was your stuff. <laughs> and we, me, would be saying things like, why, 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 why are we hanging on to that? Those, those bowls and stuff that belong to your mother and the cups that are <laughs> so high, I can't even reach them. And we know, why, why, can't we, shouldn't we? Isn't it amazing how much stuff we collect? So we had a garage sale. There was a lady in the church at that time. She was the queen of garage sales. And she came over and she helped Becky. Her name was Sherry, nice lady. So we sold some of it. And then there were some young couples in the church that could use some stuff, so we gave some furniture and stuff away to them that was, you know, good, good stuff that they could use. And then there was also quite a few boxes of stuff that ended up in the old landfill. You know, it's an expensive thing to move. Change like that is always challenging. And the excess stuff only added to the burden, so why carry it and put it in a box in the new garage, never to be opened again. <laughs> again, let me read. Let us lay aside every weight. You know, life is just too short, and the race is too demanding for us to be carrying around stuff we don't need. That's the truth. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnare us. Continuing in verse number one, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What race am I running again? My race. The one that is set before me. Us is individualized there. Each runner is assigned a lane to run in. And God is equipping you for your race. Remember, you don't run my race. And I don't run yours. I remember when I stepped away from being the pastor of Calvary Chapel Prescott, I gave a message. Uh, and after I gave the message, um, 
the, the title of the message was, I Will Follow Jesus. And afterwards, as the weeks went on, a lot of people challenged what God was doing. But it's my race. And God had spoken to me, and it was confirmed to me by my bride of 53 years. You don't run my race. I don't run yours. And neither you nor I run another person's race. There's no competition in the, in the Christian movement. There's no competition in the race. And if I take my eyes off the goal and start watching you or watching other runners... What's going to happen is the lane that I'm supposed to be in is going to get blurry because I'm looking over that way and I'm going to turn the steering wheel of my heart over there and get in your lane. Our feet are going to get tangled and both of us are going to go down. Neither one of us are going to do well. We're going to get all skinned up, have to have bandages and have bruises and all of that. Just run your own race. It isn't our job to judge the performances of others. We're not judges can't judge and run at the same time. You can't be a referee in the football game and also be the quarterback. <laughs> Jesus is the judge. So we can't judge and run or fight and judge. We're players. We're not judges. If you want to watch someone, I'll tell you who to watch. Read the Gospels. <laughs> watch him. If you want to compare your race to another, compare it to the race that Jesus ran, and that is Paul's point. Exactly. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Christian life begins when a fellow like me looks to Jesus Christ. Isaiah wrote, but really speaking, prophesying for God, look to me and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. I heard that, saw that, stepped forward. It started, really, with me looking at Jesus. And it'll end that way, too. We'll see him as he is. But in between those two experiences, the beginning of your Christian walk and then your reward in heaven, we are sanctified by an attitude of faith. You see, in good times, and there's a lot of them, in, in tough times, hard times, we look to Jesus. So becoming a Christian takes only a single step, but being a Christian means running with Christ for the rest of your life. We have to keep our eyes on Him. It's not looking at others. That'll get us nowhere fast. It's not comparing ourselves to others. That's only pride. And we only compare ourselves to other people that we think are beneath us anyway. We never compare ourselves to someone that we think is a real champion or a superstar. And the original Greek in this verse actually says, constantly be looking away to Jesus and concentrating on Him. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, especially in this day and age. Because, you know, the United States of America is just divided right now. It's just, it's really sad. I've never, you know, I'm old enough to say I've never seen it like this before, and it's really pathetic. It's very, very sad. And it can be, it's very mean-spirited. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord and stay focused. I mean, it's, all that stuff is very interesting, and we have an obligation to vote and have an obligation to understand the truth and, and, and stand by what we think is, is right, but we can't take our eyes off the Lord. We want to be champions for God, not champions for the RNC. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And Jesus will give us all we need to run our race, and he'll bring us to the finish line. He'll never leave us, he promises that. He'll never forsake us, he promised that. You see, from start to finish, the race that we run is all about Jesus. Life is all about Jesus. Family is all about Jesus. Our children and grandchildren, all about Jesus. The church is all about Jesus. The pastoral staff, it's all about Jesus. I've got cancer. It's all about Jesus. Your ministry service is all about Jesus. Our worship is all about Jesus. I was telling the group last night that Rachel plays the piano so well. I used to be a pianist at one time in my life. I was a classical pianist. I, don't, I can't even play chopsticks anymore. But I got enamored with her piano playing because she has great technique. 
And I know enough about counter. I know she's got great technique. She does a, a wonderful job. And I got more focused on the chords and the runs that she was playing on the piano than I did the songs that we were supposed to be singing. And that's wrong. You see, worship is all about Jesus. Giving. When they pass the little thing around here today and we put a check in it or some money in that's all about Jesus. Marriage and family is all about Jesus. Your it's not your top of the hill gang group. What's the name of the group? The prime time. Oh, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> 242, all about Jesus. <laughs> Trials are all about Jesus. What are you laughing at? <laughs> you know why everything is all about Jesus? Because the old scripture that we've all memorized, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jude in that book, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Isn't that true? And now I'm going to close with a song, but I'm not going to sing it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. How many of you know that song? Oh, enough that we can sing it and then we're done. Let's sing it. <laughs> I'm not a good singer. I'm, I'm a horrible singer, but let's try. You ready? Turn, turn, turn. You ready? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, we just thank you for the truth of your word. Speak to our hearts so that we can be champions for Christ in Casa Grande and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching and listening to the current series. We're glad that the Lord is blessing you with His teaching. As you continue on in the teaching of the Word of God in your life, we pray that the Holy Spirit might take that Word, plant it deep within your heart and life, that you might see the fruit of God's love, the reality of His presence, and the power of His Spirit working in your life.